I think we live. Um, yep. Kia people. Good evening um, to wherever you are in the world. Hello, hope you're well. I just want to make sure that we are live and we wait for a few comments to come through just so we know that people can watch us. Tilika, can you see that we, we live? Yes, I can, I can, I think. Okay, okay cool, hopefully Pretty I can. Calm. Yeah. Sorry, we've started a minute earlier, so. Ah, there we go, okay. Sounds good. Um, I can see that there's some comments that have started flowing in. Hello, people, how are you? Um, hope you're keeping well. Um, just wanted to introduce my colleague Tulika to you. As you see, you'll see a new face here. Now, we haven't done one of these sessions for a while. Um, the world of immigration has been extremely busy, as you've known. Um, RV applications have kind of taken over the reins. So I just wanted to um, bring in a fresh face. Tulika has just recently started with us. She's, she's also a licensed advisor. Do some introductions. But what we also want to do is we really just want to give you an, a really quick update, break it down into bite-sized pieces of what's really happening in the immigration world, because there's so much happening right now. Before I do that, and before I get into my disclaimers, Tilika, do you want to introduce yourself to people that are just joining in? Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. This is Talika, and uh, I am a licensed immigration advisor. I'll give you a little bit brief about myself. I basically entered this industry in 2015, and I joined Immigration New Zealand and worked as an immigration officer. I processed quite a few applications, but my main forte was in partnership. Uh, moving on from there, I realized that, you know, we need to go up the career ladder, and then I moved on to the license bit. And I've been working as a licensed immigration advisor for almost three years now. Really happy and glad to join Ames Global. Um, and uh, the kind of work that we get here, the kind of uh, people that I'm working with, it's just brilliant and amazing. And you, uh, happy to join you, Arunima, today for the live thank session. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, thank you, Tolika, for, that, for those kind words. I really hope for people that are joining in, we are trialing a new platform. Um, it is a new IT platform that we're trialing for this Facebook Live. So if one of us falls out or something happens, then my apologies in advance. Um, I also thought it would be good for us to trial a new IT, IT platform, especially because, as we know, immigration has moved to a new online platform. So I think that is sort of the genre here. We are moving to new platforms. Um, so if one of us drops out, you know, bear with us, we will come back. If you do have questions, please start posting them in the comments, because we do want to use the next 40 minutes or so to actually go through as many questions as we can. And if we can't go through all the questions um, during the session, we will absolutely come back to you individually as we normally do. So that's that. Um, now, I think we are going to break the session into a few parts because it is pretty heavy duty. The changes that have been announced um, have been spread across the entire spectrum. What we're going to start and uh, try and do is we're going to start off with the 2021 resident visa and the associate interim visa. Now that is sort of, it was the buzzword. It's kind of, I think, you know, it's no longer sort of the buzzword, but we want to get that out of the way and do talk about a few things for those of you that don't quite understand what the 2021 interim visa is and what the implications are. Then we want to talk about sort of, you know, what's happening at the border. There's a lot of stuff that's happening at the border and I'm going to try and we're going to try and break down the border between sort of from now to July and then July to October and then October onwards. Um, we will also talk about partnership because that remains a big you know, topic, um, lots of questions and just dependent families and you know what relief have they got, if any at all. Um, we will then also talk about what's coming in the future, which is the essential skills visa which is on its way out and an entirely new regime of accredited employers in New Zealand that's gonna be on its way in. So we're gonna talk about all of that. So um, let's start off with the first thing. Um, actually, no, sorry, my bad. Before we even get to that, um, a really important bit that has also been announced yesterday is that the, min, um, the median wage, which is $27 is actually going to increase from the 4th of July. And we are gonna talk about when we get to that section, the ramifications of that and how that impacts people. So let's start off with the one-off resident visa. 
Um, most of you should have applied for their one off resident visa if you were eligible. Um, those applications are immigration has said, Tolika, correct me if I'm wrong, that immigration is going to pick up these applications end of March, beginning of April. March. Yep, that's correct. Um, I think the, the background to that is that immigration does want to see the volumes that they get in and then put the teams together. There's, you know, as you know, they're putting quite a few resources um, towards this stream of work. Um, about two weeks ago, about 10 days ago, immigration had received about 75,000 applications, uh, which meant about 144,000 people had applied and about 24,000 just over 23,000, I think it was 23,000 and something, people had got their RVs approved and issued visas. So you can see that there's some significant numbers there. Yep. Um, do you want to add anything in the on the resident visa part before we move to the interim visa? I think we've had a lot of questions about the partnership requirements that needs to be met for the residence visas. Uh, so as we know that the resident visa requires you to have 12 months of living together, but in this one of resident visas, the another uh, you know uh, instruction basically they have come out with is that you need to include your partner if your partner has previously applied for a partnership based temporary or any kind of partnership based visas. So if they have previously applied for any kind of a partnership based visas, you have to have to include them in your applications. Now this will can be uh, you know it can be an advantage and a disadvantage for a lot of people. But especially a disadvantage when it uh, comes to partner having character issues or you're not meeting 12 months of living together. Now, if you're not meeting 12 months of living together, it's still easier because what they have stated is they might they'll just defer the application and till the time you meet the living together requirements uh, and then issue the visa to the partner. But this is we have not still got clarity from INZ. How are they going to look at it? They're still discussing. It's an internal discussion that's going on. Um, regarding character issues, I think the major uh, problem you're going to face is that if your partner is not meeting character, your entire application is going to get declined. So this is some, this is an issue. Uh, I think that if you are falling under this category, if you have concerns like this, I think it's best you speak to a licensed advisor, speak to us. Uh, we'll be the best, you know, to guide you through because this is, you can only apply for this category once. So not, yeah. do not miss your chance. Uh, speak to us, be sure what you're submitting and um, I think go ahead from there. Yep. Yeah, and I think um, the point for some of you, we've been talking to clients, the point that is so important for some of you is that you cannot not include your partner because you know if you've supported them and if you do include them, then the application is stuck as well because you've got character issues. That is a real sticky situation. Um, even sticky for sometimes, you know, for sometimes the biggest experts try and maneuver through. So yeah, tackle that quite carefully. Um, now moving on to the interim visa. Now we know that immigration is going to be granting the one-off interim visa to people that have applied for the residence um, application, the RV21, and if your current visa is expiring. But what you do absolutely need to be sure of before you move on to this interim visa is that this interim visa is not going to allow you to change visa types. If you are on an essential skills, for example, and you go on to the interim visa, you can only work in the position that you're in, only with the employer that you're in. You can't say change cities. So it basically freezes this, your status um, in the country. So it, it can be really sticky for some people. The interim visa is automatically granted once your residence is in and your current visa is expiring. Also, what is really important is that on an interim visa, you can't really travel in and out of New Zealand. And we'll talk about that in a bit because from the 12th of April, the borders will allow for people to travel um, on a temporary visa. So be really careful before you make the choice of going for an interim visa. If you do not want an interim visa, um, and there's many people, I think there's about 66% of the people that when we did a poll said that they didn't want an interim visa, that then you actually have to advise immigration or apply for another temporary visa. Otherwise, you're just going to automatically get it. So that's the RV stuff. I'm just looking at the questions. They're still, still building through, and we'll just let them build through. Let's now move on to the big elephant in the room, which is the border. Let's talk about the border. We know that the step plan has already started. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that sort of is going to come. Some of it has started. Talika, can you just very quickly please give us the dates 
on what's to come. I know it's the 12th of April, 1st of May, yeah, and a few sure. other details. So. so I think one step we've already crossed, which was earlier this March, which was 13 March, which started with the working holiday visas. Um, now the next step we have is from 12th April, which basically allows all temporary work visa holders and student visa holders with valid travel conditions to travel to India. Be, be well, just travel overseas, here. not really to yes. India, anywhere. Travel Sorry. Overseas. Yeah, travel overseas. Basically, uh, just focus on the fact that it's just work visa holders for now. The temporary work visa holders are uh, not visitors. The visitors will be allowed from 1st May. So anyone from visa waiver countries or uh, valid visitor uh, visa holders can travel from 1st May. So these are the next two steps that are upcoming in the few months. Yep. Thank you. Um, so few things that are that stand out in this space um if you are from the uk um europe you're from a visa waiver country you can come into new zealand from the first of may that's quite a major uh, what is also really important is that when these time frames and when the border begins to open that's when it starts coinciding with your new accreditation regime that's going to start opening up and we will get into that um I'm just trying to see what else uh, to cover on the border. There's there's a whole lot of stuff. Like where do we even Basically, start? Basically, I think uh, I don't know. After May, I think first May we have the uh, AWV that starts. I think uh, basically yeah, yeah. the accreditation starts. From... There's a few other things that I do want to highlight here very quickly. If you are a healthcare professional, you can still come into New Zealand. There's um, border exemptions that allow for you to come into New Zealand. If you are a nurse that's got their registration with a nursing council or is aspiring to come into New Zealand and practice, then there is a pathway here for you that's remained open um, through the critical health worker pathway. What is also really important, if you, if anybody is joining us today and you are based overseas, you are going to be working with an employer or you've got an offer with an employer that pays you over 84,240, which is one and a half times your median wage. It works out at $40.50 per hour. Yeah. If you are someone who's getting that offer, then we can bring you into New Zealand through the other critical worker category. Now, this category was almost impossible to crack. Um, lots of requirements that a New Zealand employer had to make there's been quite a few relaxations in that space. Obviously, your offer needs to be longer than six months. But if you are someone who's getting that offer, you're looking at moving to New Zealand, please contact us because the other critical worker space is really picking up. There's employees that are, you know, finally the borders are looking at some movement and you can also bring your family. So that's quite a big one in the border space as well. I think now, yeah, it's a change because it doesn't require a labor market test. It doesn't require you to show that, you know, you uh, we need those those jobs are required in New Zealand. So I think that's where a lot of people will fall into this category. And we've got quite a few clients coming in asking us these questions. So I yeah. think, yes, it is definitely a very big one. Yeah. And I think um, also because this category previously used to ask things like, why can the worker not work remotely? Why can parts yeah. of that work not be done remotely? So there were quite a lot of layers that have been taken off. So that's, that's one really important nugget to remember. From there on, when we start moving on, so if you are looking at borders in almost two parts, sort of now to the 4th of July, 4th of July is quite a significant date um, in the immigration system because that's when the entire regime is going to change. There's a lot of um, things that are going to flip around for an employer-led model. So what's going to happen from the 4th of July is that a New Zealand employer will need to have accreditation to be able to hire and support migrant workers. Now, what is really important also to remember that this accreditation is actually quite different to what it used to be. It's a very different accreditation. Um, it means completely different. It, the objectives are completely different. Why immigration decided to call it accreditation still and couldn't come up with a better word is beyond me, but that's what it is. Um, so from the 4th of July, any New Zealand um, employer that's looking at supporting someone on a visa needs to be accredited. But prior to that, they do not need to be accredited. So that is really important. From the 4th of July to October, you will possibly have two streams. You will have your accredited employers, and these employers can bring people from overseas on an accredited employer work visa, but they can also bring people in on the other critical worker category unless that phase is out and the borders begin to open. So lots of coinciding changes happening in that space. Um, this then brings us to essential skills. Now, as we know, essential skills is the 
only employer assisted work visa that exists right now, this essential skills work visa is going to be phased out. It is going to be phased out on the 4th of July, which is when accredited employer work visa takes over and this whole regime starts. For those of you that do have employers that support or they're asking about accreditation or this impacts your own roles, two very important dates, accreditation applications for employers open up on the 23rd of May. It was 9th of May, just last evening, it was moved to the 23rd of May. And then there is a second gate, which is called job check and the applications for that open up on the 20th of June. So I'm not gonna let this phase back, uh, Facebook hijack accreditation, but um, Tulika, do you wanna add anything to what I've said or any other parts that I've missed before I jump onto the questions? I think we are good with the, in, with the border uh, information. I think the basic thing is from October, 22, I think it would be the day that we all been waiting for, uh, that borders will finally open and everyone and anyone can apply for a visa. Um, I would just want to touch upon some partnership based uh, visas that people can apply for. Uh, I'll divide this into two categories that is onshore uh, based partnership visa, visas and offshore based partnership visas. While onshore would be very straightforward that because it's just going to be uh, a renewal or a, you know, a, you know, a renewal of a visa that was already, who's already onshore at the moment. So not much information there. You can apply for all visa categories, not many restrictions, but for, especially for offshore, uh, we have people uh, which are meeting the living together requirements. And then we have people who do not meet the living uh, together requirements. So if we talk about uh, partners of temporary work visa or student visa holders, we do not have much uh, respite for them. Uh, the only respite that we have is that if you already have a temporary work visa holder based on your partnership, uh, you can travel from 12th April. However, uh, if you do not have a visa right now, you'll have to wait till October to be able to apply for those categories. Uh, if we talk about partners of resident visa holders, we have two options there. If you are uh, meeting the living together requirements, you can apply for directly for the visitor or work visas based on your partnership. Uh, as you would see on from 27 February, uh, people who have those visas can enter New Zealand. So you can apply for those visas directly if you're wherever you're based overseas, provided you're meeting the living together requirements. Uh, there are also border restriction, uh, border exceptions that came in for partnerships, which basically was for people who did not meet the living together requirements in which the resident who is based, basically who's onshore requires to travel overseas, live with a partner. Uh, you apply for the border exception. And the most important part for that would be that your partner and you need to travel to New Zealand together in the same flight. And this is one option uh, a lot of people chose despite uh, having a lot of restrictions in this because they had uh, com job commitments, well, you know, they had work commitments that they had to leave, take leaves, uh, get unpaid leaves and travel to overseas, live with their partner, uh, especially during COVID time, which I think took a lot of toll financially and emotionally for people. But that was one option a lot of people chose. But I think with time, we are opening up to just straight off uh, partnership based visa categories, which would be um, you can apply for all uh, visitor and work visas as past partner of New Zealand resident visa holders. Um, in addition yeah, to that, couple, other, just, yeah. just a couple of um, things just to throw some spanner in the works there. Um, I do know that this whole fly and fetch as we used to call it, you know, you just go back, bring your partner that that doesn't exist now. It's almost like go it's stay crazy. and then get so yeah. the whole going staying showing your living together i think what is really important what you can probably hear from an immigration you know partnership expert here is that immigration has had a huge lot of inconsistency in the partnership space the goalposts have consistently shifted and True. they are still consistently shifting and it's almost like immigration is kind of working through this um yeah, as things evolve. It is very unsatisfactory, but that's, that is sort of the reality of the situation. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. So I think this is, this, is, uh, this is something that I saw throughout the period that when we started with the CPVVs, they wanted about like four months of living together. They were expecting at least three to four months of living together. Today, I submitted a, I recently submitted a CP, uh, EOI uh, with two months of living together and it came out, we got an ITA. So I think their decisions on living together are, are changes quite a bit. 
especially with uh, they are accepting living together of two months in a border exception category while they're not accepting two months in a state of partnership application. So, you know, this is something that INZ will have to work internally, but uh, the best. I can also, yeah, I also do understand because from a legislative perspective, you can't actually grant a visa that can't be availed. And if these people can't actually travel, then I think yeah. border exception is the way to go. Um, Tulika, I see that there's quite a few questions coming through, and I think we'll actually start opening up to questions. Okay. Um, I'll start saying out these questions. So the first one is. Um, have there been any updates on extension of eligibility on onshore migrants excluded from the RB21? Um, at this stage, immigration has fenced that off completely. There are no further additions to the RB21. What we can tell you and what I can tell you is that there's quite a bit of work being done on additional residence pathways. Now, they're never going to be the one-off residents. I mean, I've done immigration for 16 odd years. I've never seen something like RB. I don't think it's ever happened in New Zealand's history. I don't think it's ever going to happen in New Zealand's future, but then who knows? Um, at this stage, that is pretty much the requirements that were published are the requirements that they are. However, immigration has been talking about accredited employer work visa kind of leading into pathways to residence if you are at 200% median wage and the skilled migrant category being rehashed and reopened sometime in August. But to answer your question, no. So look, I'll give you this one and see if you um, know this. So this one says, can I apply for my RV21? It says, if I leave the country, basically. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, you can leave the country for sure. It's just that it will be put on hold uh, till you come back. And that, that's when they'll start the processing of the application again. It won't cause any debtor. It won't be a deterrent like it will get declined or anything. But obviously, it may just cause a delay. In the processing of the application. I do want to add here um, that there's a lot of people that are applying for their RVs and then, you know, provided that they don't go on to the interim visa, they have their temporary visa that has got the multiple entry, that they can actually go back home and visit their families from the 12th of April. Because the whole point of resident visa is the fact that it's, it's going to take a long time. There's thousands of people that are applying. And if this gives you the opportunity to go back to visit your family, you can absolutely do that because it's not like the resident visa is going to be processed overnight um, yeah. and as long as just remember that as long as you've got a valid visa for you to come back and your your temporary visa allows you to come back because the last thing you want to do is go out and then not be able to come in um, i'll pick this question up from claudia as well can you please advise as to how i could get my um, daughter to join as a dependent child we have submitted her under residence 21 i'm referring to family reunification uh meet criteria of one and a half salary i guess that's for you um, I, I don't quite understand the question properly, but I can tell you that as sad as it is, where immigration is opening all these visa waiver countries and visitors and, you know, working holidays, and that's been all around the media as well, there is still no relief on family reunification um, until October, which is when the borders actually begin to open. There are no border exception for situations like this. Um, Tulika, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I think that's that's all about it. I think regarding, I think what her question is basically, she's asking if she can get her twenty four year year old daughter to join as a dependent child. Um, this would come under exception to instructions. Not sure how INZ is going to look at it. This is something that we'll have to discuss with you. Oh, uh, that's what she. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Because it's outside the dependent child. Like Claudia, I would strongly suggest that you do have a chat with us. There's um quite a lot of questions that we have to ask you to be able to give you some specific advice. Yeah. So. Um, there's a whole lot of factors that come into play here. Any update on SMC? Um, like I said, this is being worked on. The last I heard was that there will be some announcements for SMC opening around August. Um, so keeping our fingers crossed that SMC in one shape or the other with whatever point system and whatever it looks like can actually open in August. Mm. Well, this technology is a bit hard. I mean, my last one, I could actually see my questions on the screen. This one's a bit, it's throwing me off a little bit because <laughs> it needs yeah, a whole lot of concentration. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see what this one, a bit out of, out of context. May I ask if the new work visa updating systems happen from July would affect the VOC as well. I have essential skills for 25.50 pay. If I want to apply VOC after July, should the new employer be accredited if I need to be paid at 27.76? There's a few questions in there. Um, in this question that you ask, and I can take this up and I can tell you what I know, what we know so far. So the first thing is, 
Um, VOC is online, so it went online when COVID happened. So immigration set up a new new IT form for it on a, on a different platform, not the new one that's coming out, not on the enhanced online. Um, the second thing is from the 4th of July, we know that employers need to be accredited to be able to support and hire migrants, which means um, if your employer is not accredited at that stage and you're looking at switching over with that employer, whether that's through a new work visa or whether that's through a variation, but actually getting tied into that employer and they're not accredited, then they can't support you. So that's sort of the second point. Now, the third thing, which is also, um, which has just been announced around the median wage just yesterday, that the median wage is going to be increasing to 2776. What we know that the accredited employer work visa is basically going to work off the median wage. Um, again, I've got very strong opinions around how unfair it is, but keeping that aside, the accredited employer work visa is going to work off the median wage, which means if you are earning a median wage, whatever that's going to be at that stage, then you can get an accredited employer work visa as long as your employer is accredited and the job check is done. If you're not um, getting paid at that, immigration hasn't announced, but we are still hoping that there may be some sector agreements, some roles that may still be able to get through, because the big question is, what happens to people that are not being paid? What we are getting back is that they won't be able to basically get an accredited employer work visa unless they are in those either the nominated lists or sector agreements. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty much what I can tell you. I really hope that immigration can, can understand that this is very unrealistic for people to move from $22 to suddenly $27.76 and for employees to afford to pay that. And there's a lot of pushback that has happened from the industry, but let's wait and watch um, and see what happens over the next few weeks and if immigration backtracks over it. But that's all I can tell you. Um, there's a question that I don't quite understand. What about if they have valid visa and expired in this coming October? Well, you need to renew the visa. You'll, have, you'll go into the new regime, which is accreditation. Um, do you want to take this one, which is around RV? How the automated system going to work with RV21? I don't understand the question. Uh, I don't understand the question. Um, there's, it's good to see that there's quite a, I'll actually give you some RV questions, Tulika, because I could take Yeah, I think we have one here. Um, any pathway to residency for current onshore tertiary students excluded from R21? If I'm in final year of students, um, I think we've covered this already. Like, as we said, not no new categories are being added to residence visa right as of now. Um, INZ has completely said that there's, there's not, they're not looking at this option for sure. So not at the moment, stay tuned to INZ. I think we'll hopefully have something new coming up later on, but not with the RB21 for sure. There's another one for you. Um, if I apply as a partner for an eligible applicant for RB21, what are the evidence they ask? We can't obviously give you the evidence, but do you just want to tell people what's what happens in the application? So basically, uh, when it comes to partnership applications, what INZ requires, what they are expecting of you is uh, to prove that you are living together, you have established a life together. So there's a series of documents that they want, they want to see before they grant you that visa. Uh, sometimes people think that it's very unfair because they've been married for 10 years and they have two kids and they still can't get a partnership based visas but and they think that you know we've submitted marriage certificate we've submitted birth certificates what what else does INC require to establish that it's a genuine relationship. Well, it doesn't end at that. Uh, apart from having a genuine relationship, they also want to see that you have lived together, you have established a life together, you're sharing household responsibilities. And to prove that there's a list of documents that uh, you need to submit to INC. And that is where we come into play. Uh, you know, we can get you, uh, we can give you the advice on how the documents are to be collected, what kind of documents have to be uh, what sort of documents you can find there so many times people don't even realize the kind of documents they have with them uh, that they can be submitted to INZ while they feel they're not of any use so I think the best thing would be speak to us so you know that what you're submitting uh, are the correct documents and your application is just one time approval application that is submitted to INZ thank you so I think that's one bit people need to be taking care of when they're applying for a partner as well yeah. Here we go. We've actually got a team. We've got two of our team doing the Facebook Live. And we've actually got one of our team members, actually two of them, actually answering to your comments in the question as well. Zinia, I can see, is actually there. So that's fantastic. I um, There are quite a few questions that are coming on the new accreditation model. Um, and I do want to talk about that very, very briefly because it does impact employers. 
um, and if there's any employers joining or if you want to take this information back, but also if it does impact the migrants. Um, this new accreditation model is very much employer led. In the current world and in the past, you know, you as a migrant, you would get the application, you would take your documents, you would get the offer letter, you would go and submit it to immigration and the visa kind of gets through. If they need something else from immigration, uh, from the employer, then immigration can ask them. It's not going to happen in the new world. What happens is there's three stages to it. The first stage is where it is, that's the accreditation, that's the whole employer needs to have that check. The second stage is actually your labor market check, which is called your job check now. So what immigration was going to do, they were going to regionalize New Zealand and have layers around it, around what regions. Um, and that was what was announced over the last two years. Just yesterday, immigration has completely scrapped that and said, nope, we're not going to do any regionalization. We are going to go with the labor market check. There's going to be advertising requirements unless you are paid at 200% the median wage. So that is quite a significant change, which means almost all well, most of the applications that go through after the 4th of July, employers will need to advertise for the role like they do currently. So that's your second gate. Only once these two gates are done, which are both normally controlled by the employer, the third gate comes in, which is your migrant. That's when the migrant will actually upload their bona fides and the character and the medical and the suitability and the qualifications and all of that that are related to the migrant. Uh, because there's a few questions in here, I did want to address sort of how that framework is going to work. In the new, there's a question here which says, <coughs> in the new accredited employer work visa, if someone holds that visa for a given time, will there be a pathway to residence? Like currently two years on a work to residence leads, um, work to residence visa leads to a residence from work, that category. What I, what we can tell you is that all of those work to residence and you know residence from work categories, they were scrapped. I mean, people that were already on those can apply, but most of them have gone into RVs. What's going to happen into this new regime, instead of having so many streams of residence, um, you will have the skilled migrant, which will come about. But what immigration has said is that if someone is paid at 200% the median wage, which from memory, my maths is not the greatest, if you work off the $27 an hour, it works at $112, um, $230 a year, roughly, I think $54 an hour. But with 27.76, it'll be high, and I, I'm definitely not doing that math in my head. Um, if you are earning at that and you're working with an accredited employer for two years, then there will be pathways to residence. So it does have some of those flavors of work to residence, but not just, just get a work to residence. There's also a very high salary attached to it. Um, what are the pathways are going to be announced? We don't actually know. God, I'll need your help with this. Silica. There's lots of questions that I can't get through. I'm like answering and yes, sure, so sure. just pick up a question that you want to answer. And I think that's how we run with this. Um, There's one question which says, I submitted my RV21 visa medical on January 22. Will that expire as the start to process application in April? Uh, no, that won't. Once it's submitted, uh, they will process it. It's just that before submission, it should be less than three months old. So I think you're good to count with your medicals. Um, I'm going to say, Zinia, stop it, because you're stealing our thunder. <laughs> you're replying to questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually it. looking for questions that Zinia has not already addressed. Get off, get off Facebook, Zinia, get off. <laughs> um, no, I think that's... Um, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, yeah. It says, when would visitor visa applications for people from non-visa waiver countries open? And the INZ website says that the existing processing time is 13 months. Is it likely to remain the same or would the new automation process bring it down? Uh, the visitor visa applications will begin from October no, uh, once the borders open up. If you already have a visitor visa, you can travel from first way. But if you want to apply for a new a fresh application, you can only do it from October 2022. I think while we're at October, it is also really important to remember for those of you that may have families, friends or whatever overseas, and they are looking at sort of coming and visiting New Zealand or just coming and studying on students. October is when New Zealand is, is going to return. Well, fingers crossed if the government stays. It may actually move sooner. The prime minister has indicated that it could be sooner. But October at this stage is the the time frame that has been earmarked for New Zealand to return to pre-COVID days in terms of immigration framework. This is when people from across the world can actually apply for visas. Um, right now, the borders are closed and you've got these little doors like your visa waiver countries and your working holidays and 
you know, all of that, that's kind of opening in that space. But October onwards, it'll be pre-COVID days. The immigration system will allow for people to apply for visas. Yep. Um, there is a question that's come quite a few times and um, by Alex, do you know if INZ can prioritize RV21 for Ukraine? Um, I don't really know. Do you mean candidates that are already here? Because, you know, immigration has put, um, put out 4,000 spots for people from the Ukraine to come in. Um, there is no announcements on any RV prioritization. I would assume that these people are applying for RVs because they're already in New Zealand. And are you asking because they hold a Ukraine passport, whether they will be um, processed on priority? At this stage, there's no announcements made around that that I'm aware of. Yep. Okay, well, that's, um, I think that quite nicely brings us to almost the end of our session. Um, we have, we have actually covered quite a lot of ground because I can feel my throat I feels- We've covered bit. mostly Sorry. all of these have come yes. through INZ. Yeah. Uh, I can't um, there, is a, there is another question, just that I'm trying to understand your question. It says how the new automated system will work with processing RV21. What does that mean? Because you are submitting through the new system. If you are from the 1st of March onwards, you're actually submitting through the new online system. Um, the new online system has a lot more, uh, has a lot less manual intervention. It has been designed to be able to tackle volumes and immigration is going to build more applications in that new enhanced online system. And so um, maybe what he's asking is once we've submitted the application, how the process may be after it, I'm not sure. Maybe to, I can just give it a brief to the, the so that if I am able to answer the question that he's uh, asking. Uh, so I think the uh, with this is that with the new online system, we submit the application. Right now, you do not require uh, too many uh, documents to submit the phase two applications. Uh, once you have submitted that, INZ will probably reach out to us in early April. Will start reaching out to us from early April and will uh, let us know what all documents you require for uh, the actual RV application. And that's when you do the submission process. Other than that, there is no other system that you need to be worried about. I think it's just the new online system that we are submitting applications under. So I hope Jasinder, we have answered your question. Um, um, do you just want to take this last question, which is a very yeah, sure. long offshore partner question, and I okay, think that'll be so our last one. This is from Jassi Chahel, and she yeah. says, hello, dear, thank you for doing the live, you're doing a great job, thanks. Thank you, Jassi. Uh, my question about offshore partner, if I include my wife in RV21 and living together only two months, so I heard immigration advisors and lawyers came together. I had discussion on that. So when INZ tell what they're going to do with the partner application who not meet the criteria and got declined previous on the basis of relationship. Um, Jesse, the first thing I would want to address is that if you have a previous decline, I think it's, it makes more sense that you speak to us first because we don't know what the decline was on. Uh, if it was something serious other than just not meeting the living together requirements, we will have to assess how we'll go about uh, addressing this issue. The other thing is that you've already applied for a partnership based visa, so you will have to apply, you will have to include your partner in the residence application. Um, now that you only have two months of living together with the available information from INZ is that they will uh, most likely defer the partner's application while they issue the main applicant's resident visa. They'll defer the partner's application till you meet the living together requirements. Uh, but keeping in mind that you have a decline, I think reach out to us, speak to us, because we'll have to first see what the decline was on before we can give you an advice on this platform. Yeah, and I do want to, because I, you know, I like to pick holes in the policy, um, as many of us do. I think it just boggles my mind how all of these deferrals are going to work when you have so many people across the borders um, that haven't traveled, haven't got visas, the immigration wheel has not churned for so many years. How long are they going to defer all of these? It's just, and we can tell you because all of these matters and all of these things in the policy have been raised with immigration but they're still working through this. Like we literally have had answers that have come and then they've been changed a day later. So this whole partnership offshore character inclusion, exclusion, deferral is a very complex piece of work that immigration is still trying to work through. But I think um, that quite nicely brings us to the end of our session. Um, lots of changes happening. Very keen to know if you, um, 
you know, how this impacts you. I know, as you see, we run polls quite regularly on our Facebook page um, and we do send a lot of information. If you do have a pressing question that hasn't been answered, um, you can private message us and one of our team members will pick it up. Please do provide details on what it is so we can prioritize your question. Um, anything to add there, Tulika, before I close it off? Well, I think we've covered all today. It was a heavy session for everyone watching, I think, uh, too much yeah. to absorb for them. I but I think we've covered today. Most yeah. Thank you for joining us, people. Stay safe um, and we will be in touch again. Thank you, everyone. Bye.